Hello, welcome to this devotional series as we make our way through the Sermon on the Mount and uh, try to understand the words of Jesus, try to commit them to memory. Thank you for joining us. At the moment, we are in uh, the prayer that Jesus taught to his followers, what has become known to us as the Lord's Prayer or, or, or the Our Father, as people call it. And we are up to our third video in this little mini series, thinking about the idea, the ideas of the prayer and uh, today we'll be thinking about the third idea of the prayer which is your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven now this one is the end of the the first half of the prayer which has all been about God so far so all of the prayer nouns have been um, your your kingdom come your will be done hallowed be your name uh, whereas, so this is the end of the first half and we're about to move next week onto the second half where all of the pronouns become our and we and us because the second half is, is not about God as much as it is about us. Uh, but we'll talk more about that next week. Um, the other way that we know that this is a kind of neat half of the prayer is that it begins by saying our Father in heaven and then it, earths by, it ends by saying on earth as it is in heaven. So you have in heaven as a kind of bookends for, for this section of the prayer. So let's talk about the line, the meaning of these words, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We'll treat it as three separate things. So firstly, your kingdom come. Now we've mentioned earlier in this devotional series that the kingdom of heaven is almost like the title of the Sermon on the Mount. And so understanding what the kingdom of heaven is or the kingdom of God, as it's called in the other Gospels, is, is crucial to understand this prayer. And it's crucial to understand actually the whole Sermon on the Mount. So let's talk about that for a little bit. Uh, at the time of Jesus, Jewish people were anticipating a time when God would come and establish his perfect kingly reign on the earth. And this would result in, in all wrongs being made right. It would mean that their enemies would be brought to justice and it would bring peace on earth. Uh, and it would be a permanent reign. Uh, this king, uh, this kingly reign of God was going to be brought about by God's anointed one. And the word for anointed one in Hebrew is Messiah. And when you translate that into Greek, it is Christ. And so Jesus of Nazareth comes along and he says that his ministry, he, he begins his ministry by saying, repent for the kingdom of heaven has come near. He says that in Matthew chapter 4, verse 17. And so it takes Jesus' disciples a little while to realize it. But what they finally come to see is that Jesus is the Messiah that was promised beforehand. Uh, it doesn't happen in Matthew's gospel until about chapter 16, when Peter finally says, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. But what we also realize in Jesus is that this kingdom is here, but it is not yet fully here. Jesus has uh, inaugurated the kingdom, but he has not yet consummated the kingdom of God. This is the language that theologians use. It is an inaugurated kingdom. It's here, but it is not yet consummated. It's not yet fully here. We already have it, and there is something that is not yet about the kingdom of God. And so when we pray this prayer, it basically means that two things. Uh, it's a prayer, firstly, that God's kingdom would grow that it would come more fully. As the church bears witness to Jesus through their words and deeds and people submit to the kingship of Jesus or the lordship of Jesus, uh, that's how the kingdom will grow. It's a prayer for that to happen. But it's also a prayer that Jesus would return again in glory and that the kingdom would be fully consummated. Because when Jesus comes again is when we will move from this inaugurated kingdom to the full and final kingdom, the kingdom that will last forever. So that's the, the line of the prayer, your kingdom come. And then the second part of the sentence is your will be done. Now, in many ways, this line is, is an explanation of the last line, uh, your kingdom come. But this one is focusing particularly on God's will. Uh, and it's an, a recognition that currently God's will is not being done in some sense. Things are not currently completely how God desires them to meet. He is still sovereignly in control over all things, but there is a gap between his will and the current situation. And this is why we pray for God's kingdom to come. 
Which brings us to the last part of the line, on earth as it is in heaven. Now what's important to notice about this line is that the goal of everything isn't for humans to escape the earth and go to heaven. I know many people, many Christians have their personal escape to heaven as the solution to all problems. But God has got his eyes set on something bigger and better than that. God is bringing his kingdom down to earth. We pray your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And so that things on earth will be as they are in heaven, which means things will be on earth as they are in the place where God has complete control and rule. And so we pray for these things. These things should be our anguish, anguished cry as we live in the already of God's inaugurated kingdom. But we are also in the not yet of his consummated kingdom. And so we call out to God and we ask him for his kingdom to come. And in that kingdom, there will be no more sin or evil or pain or suffering. God will be over all and through all and in all. And we will be his people and he will be our God. Sounds good, right? Well, as we come to the end of this first half of the Lord's Prayer, uh, I want to read to you an excerpt from John, Con John Stott's commentary on this part of the prayer, because I think he summarizes so well in these lines uh, what this prayer is about, the first half of this prayer. It refocuses our natural orientation to our, from ourselves and forces us to think of God first as we pray this prayer. So let's read this together. It is comparatively easy to repeat the words of the Lord's Prayer like a parrot, or indeed a heathen babbler. To pray them with sincerity, however, has revolutionary implications, for it expresses the priorities of a Christian. We are constantly under pressure to conform to the self-centeredness of secular culture. When that happens, we become concerned about our own little name liking to see it embossed on our notepaper and hitting the headlines in the press and defending it when it is attacked. And we become concerned about our own little empire, bossing and influencing and manipulating people to boost our ego. And we become concerned by, by, about our own silly little will, always wanting our own way and getting upset when it is frustrated. But in the Christian counterculture, our top priority concern is not our name, kingdom and will, but God's. Whether we can pray these petitions with integrity is a searching test of the reality and depth of our Christian profession. They are challenging words. Why don't we pray? Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.